thank you for talking to me. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, so can you talk about how you first got involved in the show? Yeah. Um, there, um, there's a, there's a, there's a story that I tell and it is a true story. Uh, um, last spring when the, uh, global pandemic was beginning to take hold, I, like a number of other actors, uh, began to wonder what the career implications might be. And it became increasingly clear, uh, clear that the entertainment industry was gonna get seriously affected by these extreme measures. Mm -hmm. So um, it was just a strange sort of quiet, calm time and an uncertain time. Mm -hmm. uh, in early 2020, I had one confirmed gig. It was booked and contracted and it was a theater gig. It was a fabulous job. Um, but I began hearing stories and news about uh, live theater venues shutting down across the country. And I thought to myself, man, that is, un that is truly unfortunate for so many theater actors that companies are being forced to shut their doors. Mm -hmm. um, but I hadn't heard any any new news about my gig. So for a brief period of time, I thought, wow, how lucky I am to still have this job. But my relief was short-lived and I received a phone call from the artistic director. Uh, and he said, he unfortunately had to cancel the uh, theater season. So there I was officially unemployed and convinced that COVID-19 was going to kill our industry for the remainder of 2020. A part of me was, was resigned to the fact that it was going to be a cold, long, dry year. And so I retreated to the garden and to the wood shop and began filling my time with projects around the house. So I was going to grow this long, unruly pandemic beard and become a gardening, carpentering, wine sipping hermit. But then one day out of the blue, my agent called and sent me a self tape audition request for a new series for sci-fi. And she was unusually enthusiastic about the material. I mean, she, she really loved the material. Um, and she thought I would too. And this piqued my curiosity. So I put down my garden hole and my power drill and my glass. Of, well, no, I didn't put down the wine, but I held on to the wine and I went inside and I pulled up the script and the sides on my computer. And I was immediately fascinated with the material and the dimensionality of the character of August Ripley and the terrific blend of drama and humor in the writing. So there were about 12 pages of text in the audition material, and it was quite dense and technical uh, in nature, as you can imagine, for this character. And the casting director was requesting a self-tape in two days. So I called up my agent, and I told her I was totally on board to read for the part. Um, but I said that uh, I didn't want to rush all that fabulous uh, beautiful text into a, a short preparation time. So I requested an extension past the weekend uh, to really play with the material and develop the character. And the, char and the casting director was happy to accommodate. So I began playing around with Augie and absorbing the really sharp, intelligent, wonderfully balanced writing. And the extra time I was given enabled me to really search for the, for the soul of the character. By Monday morning, I was prepared uh, well, as prepared as I could be, and um, an old friend helped me put myself on tape, and uh, the rest is history, as they say. But of course, there was uh, um, a strange element of fate mixed into the story, because had that play that was scheduled for October not been canceled, I may never have even taken a look at the script. I have a funny way of putting blinders on to other projects once I, um, once I commit to something. And I hate to back out of something once I've made that commitment. Now, that, that's not to say that I, I, I couldn't have been persuaded to think twice about that moral stance. 
uh, with a television project like so real estate doesn't come come along every day. And in the cold light of day, I might have I might have made a had to make a, a, a tough decision because I really loved that theater project that I was con but I thankfully I didn't have to. And so in the middle of 2020, I was offered the role and my hermiting, gardening, woodworking days came to a, an abrupt end and I started receiving scripts and preparing for a four month shoot in St. John's, Newfoundland and I got to keep the beard. Did you do any um, taping with the other actors virtually? Cause I, I remember on the one panel, Tim had said something about auditioning for Zoom I was just curious if you like saw anybody else, I guess, before you actually went to film. Uh, any of the other cast? Yeah, yeah. No, no. Uh, I um, I had met Tim uh, on, an, on an occasion because we worked together on a, a series called Digstown in Nova Scotia. I've been on that series for three seasons. He was on it for the first season. But up until the point that we, uh, did a, a Zoom read through in Newfoundland. None of us had, had had met each other at all, so it was quite a strange thing, and it just sort of felt like an icebreaker when all of a sudden everybody popped up on camera, and it was just it was fascinating just watching everybody because everybody seemed so perfect for their for their parts, right? And it just it was just I, I was sitting back there and I was just going, you know, just taking it all in. What, um, other than the script, where else have you gotten inspiration from? Like anything that, you know, you kind of connect to with him that you think about as you were creating him? Well, you know, uh, George Olson, our creator, showrunner, uh, is such an incredibly skillful writer that all of the subtle shades of character were right there in the material. And I could, I could envision August Ripley just closing my eyes or, sk or skimming through passages of his dialogue. And I didn't have to look too far afield to find inspiration on him. You know, of course, every actor relishes the opportunity to bring a little personal touch to the role. And so one can't help but draw on um, individual rhythms or innate qualities that bear some sort of a, a resemblance to the scripted character. Uh, so, you know, there is some of me, perhaps a lot of me in August, but I also, you know, drew inspiration from interesting, unique, memorable personality, you know, professorial type characters that I remember. Uh, you know, for example, uh, the great Cornell West, or uh, the American physicist Julius Sumner Miller. It was nothing overly uh, overt or specific, but just uh, drawing from cadences or speech patterns or inflections, sometimes from memory and sometimes remembering clips from their television uh, appearances. Uh, you know, it, it was just all, all of that added to, uh, up to a uh, a, a wonderful addition to a bag that sort of was Augie's character bag. Um, I mean, there's, there's one thing that's, <laughs> I, I, I don't really know whether it influenced the way I played the character, but uh, there's a story I tell about when I was a kid and my father, funnily enough, his nickname for me when I was a kid was Professor. And he used to pat me on the head in the evenings, uh, you know, as the TV watching hour would draw to a close for me and my younger brother. And he would say, okay, professor, time for bed. And off I would go slumping, dragging my bottom lip on the floor up the stairs to bed, way too early for my liking. Uh, but I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. Was I colored by the fact that my father imagined me as a professor? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> he uh, always has a quote. <laughs> Do you have like a favorite one that you can think of? If you can't, that's okay. Just kind of off the top of your head, maybe a favorite of one of the ones he spouts off. <laughs> well, uh, 
I mean, the one that's the, the one that's gotten the most sort of uh, media play is the great uh, the the great line from that episode where Sarah Levy and I are in the attic and the raven is around and he just pulls a quote from the the uh, Edgar Allan Poe uh, poem, The Raven, and he just says, nevermore. She says, she says, that must have been a crow or something like that. And I say, it was a raven. She goes, are you sure? And I say, nevermore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was just such a classic, beautifully timed uh, piece of dialogue. So I, I like, you know, he's got some great quotes and I, I, I could I could sort of dredge a, a few others up, but that one is the first one that pops to mind for me. What about his inventions? Do you have a favorite? And are there any that you can maybe tease that are coming up? Well, that's a bit of a difficult question because episode by episode, George and the, the, the team of writers and the production team come up with some completely kick-ass things. And I don't want to be a spoiler, so I, I'm, I, I don't want to talk about um, the wonderful devices that Augie comes up with for later episodes. But up until episode four, I, I guess I sort of got a kick out of that gizmo that I was walking with in the street in uh, a house is not a home. You know, the one that was all tricked out with those revolving metal spirals and ominous whirs and blips. It was as you would know, it was designed to detect psychokinetic energy and activity. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was really cool. To, I mean, the props, props people would just sort of plop something into my hand and I would go, wow, it must do something. <laughs> and so <laughs> it was just sort of great. And the, and the fun part really is when something gets sort of dropped in your lap, you find a way to make the audience believe that you know everything about it. And so that was one of the devices that I thought was pretty cool. Another one uh, was the device he invented in that same episode that would uh, allow Luke to quote, instantly render an entity into irreparable particles. That was pretty desirable. Yeah. And of course, I love Augie's specialized goggles and eyewear. And I get a sense the, the, yeah, the fans get a kick out of them as well. Yeah, that's probably something people will cosplay coming up. I'm sure you'll, yeah. you'll see that at some point. Um, <laughs> you know, it, is it hard kind of remembering all his tech jargon and, and those kind of things? And also even, I mean, even the quotes, a lot of times the way he delivers them, they're kind of, you know, very exacting. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I've been asked on a couple of occasions whether uh, Augie's technical jargon or use of colorful or flowery quotes uh, from great writers in time was difficult to manage. And I have to say, no, because George Olson managed to create um, such a, a realistic and dimensional and articulate man in August that uh, it just made perfect sense that he acted as a voice of wisdom, sometimes his own and sometimes as a conduit through which the wise and profound thoughts and musings of great literary minds pass through. Um, I mean, having this material for me actually made me constantly eager to read uh, the books and seek out the information on the authors quoted. While I was in uh, Newfoundland on location, I ordered a number of books on Amazon based on Augie's quotes from certain episodes, you know, stuff like Aleister Crowley and Edgar Allan Poe, <laughs> Pearl S. Buck, Albert Camus. And so uh, ordering those and having them arrive uh, was just sort of like a special little gift that I treated myself to. Uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, I, I recognize the the good Ullman Crowley stuff because I, I mean, I didn't read it. I've, I've seen seen it not that long ago, but yeah. Um, but yeah, so is, is there any author or quote or anything that, you know, if they come to you, I mean, not that necessarily that'll happen, but somebody like you'd love to just have him quote. Is, I'm sorry? No, just if it were up to you, if the writer came to you and said, who do you, you know, oh. who do you want him to quote? 
do you have like a favorite author or a favorite i don't know scholar uh, somebody i love uh i love william blake uh i love t.s Eliot. i love you know when i was in university i used to i used to read a, a lot of stuff that was uh, i did a course that was existential philosophy and so some of the rush dostoevsky and uh kafka and and people like that and it's just you know i mean i i couldn't begin and tell you if there was one favorite because there's just so you know i i love i love poetry and i love the work the writings of blake and t.s Eliot, and mm -hmm. um i'm always and and it's interesting that you bring that question up because uh, every now and again, in anticipation of the second season, which we know is coming, we know is coming. Um, uh, I am constantly just sort of poking around online or in books and I come across things and I say, yeah, August has got to say that. August has got to say that. So it's, uh, I mean, that's a part of the character that I think uh, I sort of bear some sort of a resemblance to in that yeah. I'm fascinated by great, profound, or, or, you know, seemingly simplistic, but deeply profound expressions or sayings. And so whether this character would come along or not, I think that would, that would, that would still be a part of me, but I just sort of having this character to play just made me realize how much I sort of cherish those little things, those little little uh, gems uh, of, of wisdom that have been delivered to us uh, through greater minds than ours. Right. Now, there, there's nothing official, right? I mean, you're just hopeful. I mean, I hope so too. I really like it, but there's been no news or anything that there is in season two, has there, that I missed? Sci-fi has whispered nothing in my ear. Yeah, they're usually, they're usually <laughs> late, in, in late in telling us, so that's why I wondered. Um, yeah, well, well, hopefully, hopefully it will. I mean, I like it. I think it's neat. Um, yeah. So, do you guys have any improv on the set for the comedy, or is it mostly all kind of scripted? Uh, I, I love the I stuff. Say your character, maybe not so much. Maybe. I, I love the stuff they write for me, you know. And I, I, I'm always of the mind, unless it's just a badly written script, and and underwritten characters that I can't come up with something in 30 seconds that a writer has taken four or five hours to come up with. Right. So I tend not to mess around with dialogue. If something comes up in the moment, something spontaneous comes up in the moment, I'll throw it out there, but not with the intention of derailing the scene or, 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 or making it appear as if I want to one up the writer's and do something better because I, I don't usually find that I need to do that with George's writing. Um, some characters, uh, Mr. Adam Corson, for example, this man is Mr. Spontaneous and he loves to riff and he loves to uh, button a scene up with a with a, a, a joke or a funny bit here and there and it, and it really works for his character. Uh, my character is sort of reserved and and, and clipped and very precise. So anything that I use that might be humorous at the end of the scene is probably better out of the, out of the pen of an author than out of, my, out of my mouth, you know, so. Yeah, he's a, he's a bit more serious. Yeah. Um, so is there someone that maybe you wanna have more scenes with that you haven't gotten to work a whole lot with yet? Absolutely, yes, Sarah. And I, uh, we, we have a, a wonderful little, uh, WhatsApp chat group and you know it's we started it up when we were in Newfoundland and it continues to this day and we constantly just sort of check in with each other as the the shows are airing and as more information comes out and I mentioned that in the first season I had a, uh, a special moment uh, a special scene with all, all the characters. And, and it's not to say that I haven't had a, a moment with her, but a, a, really, a really full fleshed out scene mm -hmm. wasn't there for me and her character. And there's this sort of beautiful sort of chemistry, I think, between all the characters, yes. But I, I, uh, 
when she was sort of a bit of uh, the outsider in the beginning, August still stands up and pulls out her chair and greets her. He might roll his eyes uh, at, 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 her, uh, at, her, at her way of being a little bit, but he's a gentleman. And he understands that boss man Luke didn't bring her in for no reason and he knows what he's doing. And so I, I give her that uh, uh, type of respect. Um, but I mentioned to, to, to Sarah on a number of occasions that I, I, I look forward to a second season because I'm looking forward to that, to that scene. I'd love to do uh, a little special scene with her. Okay, cool. Um, if you have time for a couple more, I know it's been yeah. a while. But um, I was just going to ask, I did get a, get a fan question. They wanted to know, um, are we going to get any more backstory um, on your character soon? Like, where do we know where he was before he came to the agency was actually what they asked. See, now, this is the thing. Uh, when when uh, I was having conversations with George, uh, um, leading up to the beginning of the season, and, you know, even in preparation for my audition and stuff like that, it became quite clear to me that the writers were drawing this character as a bit of an enigmatic figure. Mm -hmm. And so there are uh, elements of my character that will probably not be revealed as quickly as some of the other characters, but that's a purpose, that's a, that's a, I think it's a purposeful thing. I see my character as uh, like a, a bearded onion. <laughs> and, well, that's and a good quote. A bearded. <laughs> that's going to be my quote. A bearded yep, yep. onion, August Ripley, the bearded onion, and yep. uh, and his layers are. are I, I think it, I think it's intentional that his layers are going to get slowly revealed over the course of uh, sci-fi, a number of seasons. Uh, so. Uh, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to go into to, uh, elements of backstory except for things that have already been revealed because I believe it is uh, their purpose that they, they, that they want to sort of take their time. Mm -hmm. And uh, because Augie has got this sort of quality that, you know, when he's, when he is in a comfortable environment, you know, there are times when you see a bit of the warmth, there's there. I mean, there are different uh, sides to Augie, right? There's this mm -hmm. this this weird sort of quizzical sort of uncle character who's always popping off these weird quotes and shit. And then there's this. Uh, you've seen all the episodes, so you'll know what I'm talking about when I when when I say there's all, there's this fatherly quality that he adopts mm -hmm. in a beautiful scene. I'm not going to be a spoiler. It's a beautiful scene between Augie and uh, Zoe, but th that there is a scene, and I think I think that our fans are going to really love that. It's a really heartwarming moment, and it reveals it reveals a bit about her character. And, and you know, he, he up until episode four and into episode five, slowly, bit by bit, you see elements of his character revealed in his relationships because he's got different is the wonderful thing about this script and about this project is that and it's not there with all with 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 all episodic television programs because sometimes relationships and dialogue are interchangeable you close your eyes one character speaking to the next could be any one of five or six characters most mostly in procedural cop dramas it's just like any one of those five characters and I won't I won't blow off the great ones because they do it better and that's not the case with them but with a lot of them it's just like you could shuffle the script around and you could pass any yeah. set of uh, uh, pages to any of the five actors and it's all the same uh, I think the wonderful thing about this is that there really is a sense that when you're watching and when you're listening to the, the characters as they deal with each other, there is a clear way in which one character deals with one as opposed to another. This is chemistry, like Zoe has got a certain, I think, 
I would be, uh, I think I'd be accurate in saying she's got this sort of warmth and mm -hmm. affection for August. She sees him as a, you know, as almost like a father figure or an, an old, uh, older uncle or whatever. And there's almost a, an uncle-like quality or um, a brotherly type quality with Tim. There's a warmth. August in a couple of the uh, workshop scenes early in the season, there are moments where you can feel uh, August's affection and care, you know, when he sends, when he sends Luke off into the field with a, a new device, he's genuinely concerned about mm -hmm. his well-being. Um, so I think in terms of what I can say about uh, a backstory, there are things that will be revealed. There are things that will be revealed this season. And I just don't want to jump ahead of the uh, ahead of the train and and blurt out anything because I I think that uh, others will others others will uh, address that their own way. I just think that the George and the writers, uh, the production went to the effort of sort of crafting a character that just sort of exposes himself one uh, piece at a time, and so I think that. Uh, the question you're asking me is a genuine interest from people who are watching the show because they don't know yet. They don't know mm -hmm. and they want to know. Yeah. I'm going to just tell them, just sit back and be quiet because I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. I'm not right. going to tell no, you. I get, that. <laughs> I get that. Sorry. I know it's getting really late. I, I didn't mean to keep going. I just, I have one more question and then I'll let you go. I, I just want to ask you, I was like a huge Haven fan. So <laughs> could you just really quick kind of talk about just kind of working on that. And do you see any of that cast anymore since then? Um, you know, uh, I don't see, I don't see uh, the main cast because most of them are down in LA. I'm up here in Toronto. Uh, there are, there are a lot of people who played um, recurring characters on that show that are up here. Uh, funnily enough, a series that I'm working on now, uh, just finished wrapping the third season called Digstown. Vanessa Antoine, who is the lead in that series, played a character on Haven. We didn't have any truck with each other, but uh, she, uh, when, I, when, she, when she and I were both, well, she obviously, she's the lead in this, in Digstown, I'm, I was cast as her father. Uh, that's one of the sort of plugs that they use to sort of promote uh, uh, our uh, relationship is that we were both together on on Haven. Um, I there are some there are some fans who are who love surreal estate and who well because they're both sci-fi projects right and uh, there are a number of people who are really hooked on this show and are, are happy that it's uh, a good, it's, it's had a good outing so far. Um, and almost sort of compare it in a way to the sort of the success that, 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 that Haven enjoyed on sci-fi. So uh, the, the answer is not really, I, I, I don't, you know, all of the cast of, well, uh, most of the cast of Surreal Estate uh, I could have run into here um, on occasion. Uh, some, some are down in LA, you know, Tim's in Montreal. Um, but I haven't seen, I hadn't seen, I haven't seen the Haven, the Haven folks in, in the longest time. Okay. I'm just curious. I missed that show. That was a yeah. fun show. <laughs> it was, it was a fun ride. It was a fun ride. I was on that. It went, went for five seasons and I was on it. I, I think I spoke, I, I spoke the very first line, I appeared on camera and spoke the very first lines of dialogue in the very first episode of that show, because I was, I was, uh, I was Emily's, yeah. I was Emily's FBI handler, and I was the one who sent her off to Haven, and I made it through three seasons, and they, uh, they seemingly killed my character off, but he was this sort of immortal type figure. I mean, the funny story is that I, I had, I, I had, because uh, Howard, Agent Howard had some great suits. And I said to my agent, I said, you know what? Can we get in my contract that I get to keep, keep them. suits? And so they said, yeah, not a problem. So when they killed my character off in the third season, they said, they, 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 they packed up my suits 
and shoes and socks and some shirts and they and they ship them they fedex them to me here so i had them and i had these great suits that i could wear out and wear to auditions and stuff and then a year or so had passed and my agent called me up and she said she said you know those suits and things that haven gave you she said well they want them back and i said oh shit and they want you in them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, I thought you came back in the in the disappearing barn or whatever. Yes, no, ever they, since I've seen it, but yeah, the yeah, they 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 brought him back, and he became this what 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 I can't remember the term. This sort of the the barn, the barn whisperer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know something. Yeah. 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 Okay. All, all, right. all right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It was a okay. nice interview. So um, have a good oh, night. Okay. Take care. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. All right. Bye.